justify you're literally saying i don't want to put all my eggs in one basket so i want to move from concentrating on a and then create b c d hello let me begin first by expressing my profound thanks to everyone that has subscribed so far and those who have liked the videos that have been posted before now and are also engaging and thank you it, it only gets better so today is another day of discussion and today is one day i want to discuss a topic that was born out of a, con uh, a conversation a casual conversation with a colleague and we're discussing about economic diversification and so we came to a common realization that there's perhaps a misconception about what it actually means to pursue economic diversification reforms in countries so in a nutshell i would start by trying to define what economic diversification means and then move to, from there to highlight what it could mean if an economy is not diversified and then perhaps touch upon how that could affect a citizen or anyone who is in a country where the economy is not diversified in that sense. So when we talk about economic diversification, we are actually talking about, well, let me start with the term diversification in itself. So when you want to diversify, you're literally saying, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. So I want to move from concentrating on A and then create B, C, D as options. Um, so that in case A fails, I can leverage on a B, C, or D, uh, all the rest to ensure that I maintain st stability. So essentially, what economic diversification helps to do is to de-risk or to prevent a, a terrible failure in any system. So you hear investors talk about diversifying their portfolio and that is because they do not want to um, invest only in one particular stock or any other form of in investment um, instrument. So they, because perhaps if there is a crisis and that one stock is hugely affected, now they, they run the risk of losing everything. So in that same sense, an economy or a government could say, look, we want to have a policy or a reform agenda that deals with diversifying the economy. So what exactly does that mean? Most people think about economic diversification with regards to the gross domestic product of a country, which tends to sum up all the final goods and services that are produced in the economy um, in terms of value addition. Um, but it's not necessarily so uh, because what really we try to do when we talk about economic diversification is to diversify the sources of income, mostly with regards to revenues or exports or um, investments that come into the system so that government has a fiscal space enough to implement its policies. Um, they are kind of related because of course, there should be a positive correlation between increased government revenues, exports, and investments with um, gross domestic product. Um, but why it's important to clarify this is because in certain sectors that produce, uh, that generate the most revenue or through exports or however um, else or through investments. So for instance, in some countries that are resource dependent, 
So for instance, the resource commodities um, crude, that's oil. So if you're exporting oil, and then you, you're using that to literally um, run your economy, then in that sense, you have, you're, you're sort of relying on that particular sector to run the economy. But what we found that that is that most times, most of the time, that you have high revenues coming from that particular sector doesn't always translate into that sector contributing the most to your gross domestic product. In fact, most times it's the opposite. You still find out that more jobs are created in other sectors, even though most of the time they're low paying jobs because those other sectors are affected by the um, overvalued or um, uh, overperformance of the particular sector that is bringing in a lot of the revenue. Um, so from there I go to, I've tried to define this, so I go now to what it means for a country um, to not be successful in diversifying its economy. If a country is so hugely dependent on one sector or one commodity or a set of commodities uh, to run the economy in terms of um, revenue exports, whatever, it has a potential risk. And that is a risk that has to do with the cyclical nature of this, uh, the business, what we'll call business cycles. And so there will always be booms and busts because of the volatility or the uncertainty related to the commodity prices. So take for instance oil. I'm sure most times you hear, oh, oil prices are high today. Well, no, tomorrow oil prices are low. So what that entails is that you cannot really say, oh, there is this one particular price for oil. And if you're maintaining a certain level of volume of exploration, it means at some point, your the revenues you get from oil or the sale of oil, if you're a producing country, will be low at some point and it will be high at other times. So that creates a, 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 a level of distortion or uncertainty in the market and in, in, the, in, the, in that particular economy. And whenever there are uncertainties, it, it will definitely affect every facet of that economy, including you and I. Um, so take for instance, during COVID, we saw what ha happened oil prices were low because there was obviously a demand shock. A lot of um, countries were not, because movements, people were not really demanding so much of oil. So there was a supply, excess supply or a glut in the system. And of course, prices fell. Now, when that happens, what you notice is that first of all, governments have an issue with maintaining a fiscal balance. So they run into huge deficits because that's for countries that are deep, highly dependent on these resources. So that leads to a compromised budgeting system and it affects the ability of government to implement policies and deliver public services that citizens require. So roads, schools, whatever it is that is important to you and I might not be adequately delivered at that point because the first thing that happens when a government runs low on revenues is that it cuts off public investments. Capital spend takes the first hit. So what you see them doing is more current expenditure, which sometimes doesn't really, uh, you know, the multiplier effect on growth is not as high as that of um, capital. Um, expenditure, public investments. So that's one side. When you have um, an increase in, in prices, in, in, in price of these commodities, the effect of that is that you have a lot of foreign exchange coming in, especially because most of these commodities are traded in US dollars. And if you're not in the US, it's foreign exchange, um, foreign 
currency or foreign reserves obviously get a boost. Um, so in that sense, you have a lot of inflow of capital. That is good in itself, but because most of the capital is not as a result of a lot of productive activity in all sectors of the economy, but only driven by one sector, what then takes place is that you have an overvalued um, currency. And when you have an overvalued currency, the impact of that is you are literally running the economy on the basis of rents. So it's more of rents. Rents are like earnings that go way above what it required to take keep a particular sector in its optimal um, state. So when that happens, governments could become a little bit more um, tempted or have the appetite to go into some level of spending that might not be in line with the objectives of, of um, what citizens require them to do um, because there's excess rents in the system. One major problem of that, or, or a term that is used to classify this sort of problem is called the Dutch um, disease, um, where the performance of one tradable sector affects the uh, performance or lack thereof of other tradable sectors in the economy. So it, one tradable sector could be oil, um, oil and gas or um, oil activities, commodities and all, but you also have manufacturing, you also have um, industry and other forms of even agriculture. Those are sectors that could produce in, and be exported depending on the level of value addition that, that takes place. Um, so the fact that you have so much of rents coming in from that sector creates a, a level of deindustrialization, and so most of these countries bypass manufacturing, agriculture, and other sectors, and then move over to services. Uh, so the service sectors are booming, are growing, but they are not growing as a result of a huge manufacturing base. Or and, and so we see that a lot in. In most of these resource abundant countries except for the cases of countries like Norway that have been able to properly institutionalize um, their their own resource abundance and utilize it in ways that curtail this tendency towards uh, the Dutch um, problem the Dutch di disease um, problem so what you then have is a rentier economic system where it's all about the transactions that come as a result of the, the extra um, rents that come into the system. So that affects the way employment are made in the public sector, the way that um, even the way that your budget is designed. So it's it's all about horse trading and and other things because everyone wants to have a sort of share of this excess rent um, coming on board and that. Um, affects the performance of other um, sectors because one sector is just having that concentration and there's so much coming in from there so the tendency to want to use that it requires strong institutions to get other sectors to perform at you know good at a good enough level to equate or balance that um, um, resource sharing amongst all the other sectors so that is what economic diversification would do if you have other sectors performing as good enough to be able to mitigate in case there's a shock coming from one sector. But most of the time we see that most government institutions or, or governments don't have that um, incentive to go about those far-reaching reforms because in times of boom, all they want to do is to increase spending on different other projects and not necessarily on core reforms that may, may not materialize today. Um, so 
uh, for most politicians, they want to get re-elected, so they'll rather go into transfers and other kinds of programs that would yield short-term benefits rather than building strong institutions and really deepening other critical sectors to ensure that productivity um, happens.